fun morning. Ah, deep breath because it has been a week. Usually on Monday, I have like, I'm like eager to get a video done because it's, I, I take a break from Friday through Sunday and it's just been a week. It's been hard. I've had a lot of interruptions, a lot of going on in my life, kids going to camp, kids coming back, um, just all this stuff going on. And so yesterday I, and yesterday I had to go hide. I had to hide and go get that scripture reading done. And it was really for me. I needed it. I was like, I just, I'm going to go hide and I'm going to read through some Psalms because I really need the Psalms today. And um, today I woke up just on fire. Like, okay, it's Tuesday. I want, I want to share, especially because God's given me a green light to share something I wanted to months ago. But, um, it's been a week and I kind of feel like it fits right into this lesson of when the faithful grow weary and hand in hand with that, when the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Often, when we grow weary, the reason is because we're not nurturing the spirit and the flesh is somehow feeding off of something and we have to discover what it's feeding off of and eliminate it, right? And sometimes it's really sneaky stuff. But when you start to feel that weariness, that spiritual weariness, automatically think of the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And when you think of that phrase, I always think of a child. What am I feeding my spirit? How am I feeding my spirit? Am I treating God's word like a multivitamin? I just take one in the morning, maybe one at night. Or am I feeding, am I feeding my spirit three meals a day? And it's a silly analogy, but I've noticed when I start to dabble in God's word rather than devour it, my spirit grows weary because the times we're in guys, like it's just, it's time to feast on his word because when you're not, you can feel just this heaviness settle over you. And I've been praying about it for days. Like father, I just feel kind of gloomy and I really don't have a reason almost like depression, but I'll be like, but I reject that because I'm not depressed. Like I have joy, right? Like, um, I could list out all my blessings, all the things I'm thankful for. And yet this gloominess just kind of weighs on me. And I just think it's the time we're in. And I have to stop and ask myself, am I feeding my spirit? Is the spirit within me being fed? Or have I neglected it? And sometimes it can be after something wonderful, like a spiritual high, and you're just drained, right? You're just drained. Or sometimes I've noticed it happens right before something big is about to happen. And you may or may not even know. And I think of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And in fact, I'm going to start there. I'm going to read that. Um, they just had their Passover meal where Jesus made it very clear something's about to happen, right? I'm about to give myself up for you. And then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm just going to start reading verse 36 in chapter 26 of Matthew. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. 
When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. This whole picture, this whole picture speaks volumes. Volumes, right? When you, when you think of the faithful being weary, I'm reading this, and I'm just now thinking of Jesus. Because prior, when I picked this passage, it was for that statement he said to his disciples, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. But as I'm reading it to you and to myself, it's hitting me how weary Jesus himself had to be. I mean, just what that first few lines, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He knows what's coming. We don't always know. Sometimes we get a clue, right? He knew what was coming. You want to talk about being weary? He knew what he was about to face. And he needed support. I don't know how many times I have been in a moment where I was going through something awful and I needed support and it wasn't there. You know how you almost feel extra lonely? You, you, like those are almost the loneliest moments of your life. And our Savior, he knows what that feels like to be facing something insurmountable and to feel abandoned by those who say they love you. And he picked his three closest disciples and he asked them, stay here and keep watch with me. And then he even welcomed the first time, right? Watch and pray so that you will not fall in temptation, into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And even before that, he said, could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? Like I can just almost feel the heartbreak inside him. Like you don't realize what I'm about to do and what I'm about to face. And I'm going to do it all alone. Can't you just watch with me right now? Can't you just pray. <laughs> we are, we're so fallible. We're so fallible. And Jesus, perfect as he was, he got to taste that weak body, either within himself when he was hungry or ill, right? Or just by those around him, surrounding him, watching and witnessing constantly how we stumble and fall how we are weak, how we can't even just stay awake. Um, this hits me because this week I have been hit by a fatigue, just a hard one, just tired, exhausted. Like, why am I so tired? I can't seem to get enough sleep. And I'm, I feel like I would be one of these disciples. Can't you just stay awake for one hour? Watch, pray. You know, your spirit is willing. Your spirit's willing. And I, I just, I feel the beckoning of the Father and Jesus and the Spirit like all around the world right now because so much is going on. And I just feel like he's saying, you need to watch. You need to pray. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into, into temptation. The Spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Our enemy knows our weaknesses. He knows how to strike us. He knows how to make our ministries watered down, ineffective, or even obsolete. Just make us disappear. Make us give up. Or just make me wake up grumpy today before I share a video. Because that was me today. I, I came into work almost just assuming I'd be interrupted again and again and again. I have been, it, it has been jarring. Like I, I have not had a peaceful moment in my office for weeks. And it's kind of ironic because it's summertime 
and half the staff's gone most of the time on vacations or um, Bible camps, retreats, and yet I have been more interrupted than I've ever been. And I've been tired, exhausted. And so, you know, God fills me with this desire to share this message, how the spirit is willing, but the body is weak, and how these faithful followers are getting weary. And yet within me, I'm already getting ready to be upset. But Father, I'm always interrupted now. I, I have no peace in my office. And I should have just trusted him, right? Because when he wants something said, he'll make a way. And I think sometimes how many times do we talk ourselves out of doing something because of the what ifs? What if this happens? Well, I don't really feel like I'm in the right mood for this, so I don't want to fake my way through it. Don't fake your way through it. Get on your knees and pray. Read his word. That stuff will go away. The enemy wants you to believe it's there to stay. You're going to be grumpy all day today. No, rebuke that. You, you don't have to accept that. I used to when I was younger. Oh, this is going to be one of those days. No, this is a moment. This is a moment and I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of it and I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to let Jesus be in control of today, not my mood. It is, it sounds silly, but it's so effective putting us in a bad mood, keeping us tired, keeping us weary, keeping us focused on our problems. It's so effective. Your spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The enemy knows what, what to target. He knows what to target. Um, illness, fatigue, interruption. He studies us, right? He studies us. Um, and I just, I think of Paul in Romans when he was breaking down the law and how the law can almost make you feel more sinful, right? Because he says like, you know, before the law, I didn't really think about coveting. But then the moment I was told not to covet, suddenly I covet. I mean, you know, like it's so human. The moment you're, you're told do not, you want to. And it's, it's one of those things where a Christian has to learn to focus on the good, to focus on the positive. That's why I love flipping the law around and saying it's all about love because the enemy wants us to focus on the do nots. Because when you focus on the do nots, one, you become judgmental to all those around you. And two, it is so hard to not fall into them. It's like they become, the taboo becomes more of a desire now. And then you find yourself doing the secret sins, right? Because I have to believe that this is, well, this is the law, do not. So, you know, on the surface, I'm going to follow this, but in secret, I'm going to do what I want. And then I'm going to turn around and be judgmental. Jesus came to show that the law at the core is about love. And when you focus on love, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving everyone around you as yourself, you don't want to cause them harm. It's no longer this fun taboo. You want, you want to do right by others. You want to do right by them. You want to do right by God. You want to honor him. You want to show him your love because he's given us everything. He's given us everything. But okay, Romans 7, 13, because I feel this often when, when I think of my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. 
for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And then on to chapter eight. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. My spirit's willing, but my flesh is weak. According to to the spirit, not living according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. There's always going to be the struggle of doing the things you don't want to do, of succumbing, of compromising, of indulging your flesh rather than your spirit. And Paul, he breaks it down and it can be tricky the way he says it, like, I do what I don't want to do. The things I hate, I do. And it, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And we have to remember who we are. Not for an excuse, but for a guideline, right? Like, the excuse isn't that our flesh is weak. That's the guideline. Your flesh is weak when it's strong. Let me explain myself. When you're feeding it, it becomes a monster. So therefore, this monster is now in control of your appetites, all kinds of appetites. And so when I think of my flesh is weak, I think of my flesh is unable to rise to what my spirit longs to do because I've fed this monster and it's looking in the complete opposite direction. It's time to starve it, starve it out. And even so, the faithful can be weary. I say this because we should be ready for anything and everything, right? Like I said earlier, sometimes your weariness comes after a spiritual high. Sometimes your weariness is because you're going through something you don't understand or you're about to face something big and the enemy is targeting you because he knows you're about to face something big. Those disciples falling asleep over and over and over again when being asked to watch, their flesh was weak. Their flesh is weak. And um, I think of Elijah. This is kind of a flip here. Elijah had just had a huge victory. One of my favorite stories where he has this competition with these Baal prophets over whose God is greater, right? My God, the great I am, or yours. And so they set out this offering and he lets them go first. If your God can burn this up, you know, tell him, bring down some fire, burn up this offering then it's settled, right? And these prophets, they did everything they could. I mean, they're even cutting themselves 
going crazy, just, just begging their God to burn this offering, to show this prophet Elijah that Baal was stronger. And I just, I love the showdown. Like, I love it because he then does a trench around his altar, drenches it in water, drenches it. You know, complete show-off moment because he knew who his God was. And Elijah calls out to God, and that fire came, and it ate up all the water and the offering. And then those prophets were dispatched. His God had won. Huge victory. I'd call that a spiritual high. But then you get to chapter 19, right after this amazing victory. And I'm going to read it. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. From spiritual high in a victory and full faith in his God to do the impossible, to filled with fear and running, definitely a spiritual low. He's ready. He's done. Just take my life. I'm done. And I, when, I, when I first read this, and I've heard this story as a kid, but as an adult reading it, a part of me was just like, really, Elijah? Really? I mean, you just did something amazing, and you're scared of Jezebel? You're a God who could rain down fire and impressed everybody, and the prophets are dead, but, but you're scared of Jezebel, and you're running? And not only are you running, but you're just... You're done, giving up. Go ahead, God, take my life. But it's so human. Oh man, have you been there where you've had a spiritual high followed by such a spiritual low? And why? I'd like to point out our flesh, ladies and gentlemen. Highs are a mix of endorphins, right? And you can only produce so many at a time and then your stores are used up and then you get a low and it sounds so base you know biology but i think it's really good for us to know we are of clay he scooped us out of the dirt and he breathes his his name into us right and we have life but we are in these very broken vessels that have huge limitations. A spiritual high is a flood of endorphins, serotonin, all this stuff, firing. And once you've burned it all, you've burned it all. Just like that offering, scorched, gone. The water's gone, the offering's gone, it's all gone. That victory, which must have felt amazing to have all eyes on his God finally, right? Not on these false prophets, not on this false God, because prior to this, other prophets who believed in God had been killed or hunted down. Elijah had been in hiding, but then he came out and this happened. This showdown happened. But then, like all humans, he faced that low. All the endorphins are gone. And as the endorphins are fleeting, he's threatened. His very life is threatened. He's exhausted. He's exhausted. He can't even go far. He goes to Beersheba and then he goes one day further, right? One day's journey into the desert. And he just plops down. I'm, 
I'm done. You can take me now. And I love how God doesn't judge him. He created us. He knows us. He knows we're flesh. He knows the spirit's willing. But the flesh is weak. The flesh in this sense is very weak. This isn't like the monster I talked about before. It's something that's been fed and is now overpowering the spirit. No, this is different. This is my body is all done. Like it doesn't matter what my mind and my heart and my spirit want to do. I have nothing in me. I am a car without gasoline. And God's response is so loving. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Sorry, turning the page. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. I just love the tenderness of this scene. No judgment from God. No harsh words. Just, you're tired. And they've even made, um, I think, a meme about this. Like, you know, even God knows that sometimes a nap and food is all you need to turn your day around. But it, this is real. This is real. This is the God who came in flesh, right? Who knows you're tired. You did something huge. It's time to rest. It's time to nourish your body. Because you've got a journey ahead that, yeah, you're not ready for it yet. The tenderness the love. And I just, I again, think of Jesus scolding his disciples and yet there's love behind it. There's an acknowledgement. Your spirit's willing, but the body is weak. The tenderness of God. I just, I, I, I feel like the loving father that is always there and the loving savior and the Holy Spirit looking at us when we're weary. And man, I don't know if you do this, but I will beat myself sometimes when I get like this. I'll scold myself. I'll, I'll tell myself all the things I'm doing wrong, how I should be doing it better. And all the while, God's like, take a little rest. Get a little nourishment. Your spirit's willing. That's why, that's why you have the stirring inside you. That's why you're frustrated. Because the spirit inside you is ready to go. But your body needs a break. God knew what my last week had been like. He knew that as an introvert, a lot had been asked of me. It sounds like an, a silly excuse, but my job is usually a haven. I can pour into my devotions. I can pick music with a feeling of intention and inspiration. I write children's lessons on fire. But the last week I've been interrupted so many times. You ever get that feeling where you, you get going and then you stopped and then you work yourself up again and you get stopped and it's so defeating. And I felt like he was just watching, but not, not scolding. I'm scolding myself. I'm getting angry. I'm getting frustrated. And why don't I feel on fire? Why do I feel like everything is such an effort instead of natural? And we got to stop being our own enemies. You will grow weary. You will grow tired. You will get frustrated. You will have spiritual lows. Your God is the God who sent an angel to Elijah. Didn't shake him away, right? He didn't shake him awake. He didn't say, get going. You have a journey. He fed him. He let him sleep. And then he let him eat again. And then later in that story, he lets Elijah know that he's got a plan, right? That all this awful, horrible stuff 
what's been going on is about to change. God is good. And I just think that when our spirit is reminded of the goodness of God, when we're reminded that our vessels are going to fail us sometimes, and as long as we don't lean into that failing, we don't feed that failing, we're doing all right. As long as we recognize the moment for what it is, and we take our rest, and we feed our spirit, right? His word is not a multivitamin. It is a three-course meal of right? Like eat eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe some snacks. Um, But when you start noticing you're treating it like a multivitamin, I bet you you're also noticing you feel weary. Yesterday, those psalms, they were like a balm, you know, like just an ointment over my soul because I just felt frustrated. Usually by Monday, I am on fire because I've had a three-day break from making a video. I've been reading his word. I'm itching to go. And instead, it was the opposite. It was the opposite. I felt dried out like a desert. And yet, I knew I have to do something. I have to read his word. Because maybe I have nothing to say, but God has something to say. So I stuck to his word. And it fed me. And it's something I can turn to and listen to. I love to listen to God's word. I love to read it, but there's something about listening to it. It feels alive. It washes over you. I I know that I fail him so many times. And I think of my children, and I know this, this analogy has been used so many times. I think of my kids and how they're learning, my older two. They're trying so hard, so hard to be good Christian soldiers, you know, for God. And they both came back on fire from camp, just ready. But then facing all those temptations, the Xbox, TV, the temptation to get angry with your younger siblings who never give you space. (laughs) And I'm watching them and I'm seeing myself. I'm seeing how hard it is to live out your desire for God. The enemy doesn't rest, guys. He doesn't seem to get a spiritual low. He doesn't seem to take breaks because he sits back and he sends out his own soldiers. They're always working. And they love to hit us when we're low. They love to wear us out. They know who you are. They know what breaks you. And it's good to know who you are too. You need to be intimately aware of your weaknesses so that you can counteract them. I'm an introvert. I have to have time to charge up. I have to have time alone. And it has to be quality time alone. I used to think, oh, I'll just hide somewhere and play a phone game, you know, because I thought alone was all I needed. Oh, no, no, no. Quality time. And it usually in his word, in prayer, or just laying there listening to worship music does wonders for me. What does wonders for you? An extrovert could be completely different. They may need a stimulating conversation. Right? It's very different for some of us. Or maybe you're an introvert, but you've had too much alone time. And you really need someone to bounce ideas off of. A sense of community, right? Look to your weaknesses. Treat your body like a fortress and scan it over. Where are the weaknesses? Where are there cracks in your wall? Where has the enemy tried to dig holes, right? To sneak in, sneak in and sneak out. Oh, he's so good at sneaking in and sneaking out before you even notice, right? Be intimately aware of who you are. Your father knows you and your enemy knows you. And it's time you get to know you too. So that you know the signals, the signs when you're starting to slip. 
I'm saying this to myself because too often it's a looking back, you know, 2020, looking back. <laughs> you, you've got to catch it in the midst. And I feel like that's where the strength comes in. The, the sense of overcoming, right? Think of, um, okay, so James 1, 12. I wrote this down today because it just felt appropriate. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And how many times Jesus said, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. I think it's time we become masters of who we are. The enemy probably knows us better than we know ourselves. And I think that's why it's so easy to just kind of sneak in and dabble a little irritation here, a little temptation there. And before you know it, you just feel worn down. I feel like the best way to combat that is, boy, oh boy, again, eat God's word, devour God's word. And then just ask him, show me, you know, like David did in the Psalm, show me, search me deep within my heart, reveal to me, because we are all different. Show me, who am I? Where am I weak? What do I need to surrender to you? What do I need to nurture? What do I need to grow in, stretch? My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Oh man. When the faithful grow weary, the enemy is so, I just, I, I see them throwing a party, you know, and then that gets under my skin. And before I know it, that alone gets me right back up. The enemy wants us weary and tired. We're not, we're not very motivating when we're weary. It's time for us to just look to some self-care but not in the world's version. Oh, the world's version of self-care is so selfish. The care of your soul, the well-being of your soul, feeding it, nurturing it, starving that flesh, right? The world's version of self-care is feeding the flesh. <laughs> Let's starve the flesh out of it. I think that's often why fasting is such a big deal in the Bible, because you're literally starving your flesh and you're relying on God. God bless you guys, because this world is tough. There's a lot going on. And even before this world got tough, this was always an issue. Sin was always an issue. Weariness, the temptation to fold, the temptation to just take a break, give up. But now is not the time. Now is not the time. We've got to stand firm. Stand firm. Put on the armor of God. Ephesians 6, right? Put on the armor of God. Be an overcomer. Stand by his side. Let's do this. Let's do this. Shake off the weariness. Feed our spirit. Stand up on the word of God. <laughs>